Hi, uh, my name is Owen Reese. Uh, I'm going to be talking about my compiler plugin, uh, Two Tails. What's that? Did it? Son of a. I'm good. I'm good again. All right. You let me know when that happens. Um, all right. So let's see. I work at Media Math. Uh, we're based here in New York City. We also have offices in Boston, Chicago, San Francisco, London, uh, a couple of places in Germany. Uh, basically, anywhere in the world, there's probably a developer from Media Math working. We are big on remote. Um, and we're hiring, uh, strangely enough. All right, so two tails. What is it? What does it do? Uh, and why is it a compiler plugin? So mutual tail recursion. How many of you guys know what that is? Can I see a show of hands? All right, so pretty good. Uh, how many people don't? How many people like cake? All right, cool. So <laughs> what kind? Uh, so just a, a brief uh, overview of recursion, which is kind of ironic that uh, a talk talking about explicit recursion is going to be uh, following a talk talking about getting it out of your code. <laughs> but here's general recursion. Uh, we all know this, probably seen it, done it. It blows a stack. Um, it's tail recursion. Uh, the difference between these two is that the code, uh, the call, if it will, is in a tail call position, which means the compiler can do a transformation and turn it into a looping construct. Can, make that bigger, can I make can I make that bigger? Uh, <laughs> All right. That's probably as big as I can make it. Because I don't know how to work this stuff right. All right, mutual tail recursion. Um, so in this case, look, there's a pong in that ping and there's a, a ping in that pong. And you know, if you loop through this, it'll go ping pong, ping pong, ping pong, right until it blows the stack. It's kind of like playing ping pong in a minefield. Um, these calls are in tail call position, but Scala itself can't do any sort of transformation to this to save you from it. And so that's why I wrote this plugin that I did, because that's exactly what it does. It allows you to have mutual tail recursion. So a little bit of uh, history. This is a, you know, I'm calling it the second act. Uh, I introduced this plugin back up in Scallop North in Montreal back in 2016. Um, one of the goals of this, this project was, and one of the things I was working on, was to make sure that it didn't introduce any external dependencies to your library. That is to say, if you were to use this and send it somewhere else and someone were to use your library, they wouldn't get an additional library dependency from it. In fact, I kind of wanted it to work the same way that Tailrec does. And that is to say, uh, your code starts like this. A depends on B, B depends on A, maybe a C, D, E, F. And it ends like this. And all you do is add an annotation, mutual rec, and it does everything for you. And the people that use your code don't even know that you put in mutual recursion. That's, that's you know, transparent to them. It's invisible. They don't see it. Um, and more than that, there's no change in the method signature. There's nothing funky being done uh, that you can see or that's visible to you. So uh, to be able to compare this, this you know, second act, the, the part that I'm going to be showing you today or, or discussing today, I sort of need to get into the weeds of how the first uh, version of the scheme of mutual tail recursion or how I implemented it first worked so I can show you like, what the difference is and what the change is and why there's a benefit to using the second versus the first for, for a more general case. So the first scheme sort of works like this. Look, you know, if you're going to put mutual tail recursion into a language, one of the ways that you can, you can add it in is using just trampolines. I mean, I think Clojure, that's exactly what they do. Um, but if you put trampolines in, uh, you're introducing another data structure and you're you know, generating a lot of objects for each iteration. And if you're dealing with uh, low latency, high throughput systems, like some of the things that I have to do at the company I work at, then you know, GC pressure is a thing. And I kind of want to avoid that. So what I did is I, I took advantage of um, structurally that there's, there's an isomorphism between uh, single function tail recursion and mutual tail recursion. And in a naive sense, uh, if you take all the code from each of your mutual recursive methods and shove it into one method and then index on which branch you want to hit, then that forms the equivalence between 
uh, a tail wreck and a mutual uh, wreck. And that's exactly what I did. It's, it's, a, it's a very naive scheme. The side benefit, of course, is, like I said, you're not really introducing any additional data structures. Um, but to do this uh, at the compiler level, there's a couple things that have to be done. And so I'm taking the method body of method A and I'm putting it into this secondary function, which is private final uh, and should be invisible to any library user of your code. Uh, and so I'm, I'm transferring ownership of uh, both the type parameters and the arguments over to this new function so that you know, any, any additional compiler plugins that you might use can still work. Uh, and I'm also doing, uh, I'm replacing like the call to method B or C or D or E or wherever it's in that mutual recursive state with a call to this mutual function plus the correct index. And so, you know, if you like recursion, you actually like writing it explicitly like I do. Um, and you add this compiler plugin and you start writing your code, well then your code looks beautiful. I mean, it's, it's like awesome. It's, it's so great. Uh, every inch of it is perfect, you know, from the bottom to the top. Um, so this, this was version 0.3.1. Uh, there was a bug. Uh, and it was great, but there is a problem. Uh, a problem specific to the JVM. Um, yeah? Oh, is that, is that the problem? Can you not? Oh my gosh, have you guys not been able to see any of that stuff up to this point? <laughs> my gosh. All right, you know what? How many, am I, I got some time here. Maybe, 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 maybe. We're gonna, we're gonna do something real quick. This is reveal, right? And so this theme here is, ooh, is that better? <laughs> what, I mean, sky beige, all right, if anyone wants to Google real quick what the other schemes are, because I'm on a limited time budget here, so I can't, uh, I can't do, what's that? I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> all right. So if you run up here, I'm going to keep talking. All right, so, so the JVM has this limit. And it says every method can only be up to uh, 64,000 characters, or no, bytes. And that means uh, if you're going to take all these methods, right, you're going to put them into a single method, guess what? You're going to hit that uh, relatively quick, probably faster than you, you thought you possibly could, uh, could hit. And he's going to set this over, and then I'm going to change slides. Did that work? No. All right. Which was this? Reduce. Invert colors. Whoa. It's readable, right, right. All right. <laughs> Just so you guys know, uh, my, my daughter, she's 18 months old, so, so like, have you ever seen a toddler dance? It's awesome. And what's your own toddler? It's really awesome. And she loves this song, so I figured out any way I could to get this song into this talk. Um, so uh, uh, a little bit of history here. Um, uh, this naive scheme that I did, the first time that I did it, it's an MVP. I mean, I knew I was going to hit this. Uh, if you go into the Scala forums, you'll actually see that someone came out and said, why don't you guys just do this in Scala? And a guy called James Irie turned back and said, because JVM method size limits. Uh, and so I didn't even know about that. I put it in, I read it later, and I, and I looked at this uh, a couple weeks ago, and I saw it, and I said, oh, man, <laughs> that would have helped. Uh, but the second act, I've changed the scheme slightly. So one of the things that I want to overcome is this JVM method size limit. Uh, so just like again, we're going to start here. And you can read this now, right? We're going to end here, just like that. Just mutual rec, just added an annotation. But 
Uh, and now where we see what the difference is, things are going to be slightly different. So it's still going to sort of look like this. You're still going to have this private function added. Uh, but uh, the previous version, I had a tail rec annotation added, which is a nice way of saying that I relied on all the hard work of all the Scala compiler guys to do e all the heavy lifting for me. I just shoved it in and said, OK, you guys handle it, because you guys have probably solved every single problem that could possibly happen. As this new scheme, uh, I have to do that. And so it's a lot more complicated. And so it, it's, it's really great to stand up in front of a, a group of people that are really interested in pure, uh, side effect free, <laughs> functional code, and basically tell them I'm going to stick a bunch of bars and functions that return unit into their code. But it's at the comp compilation stage, so you guys shouldn't actually ever see this. And a lot of things do this anyways. Uh, you can probably guess from looking at this what's going to happen here. There is a while loop. There are some vars happening here. Uh, and it looks sort of like this. I'm going to come in at the transformation. I'm going to assign these you know, type parameters again back to this new mutual function. Uh, but instead of your arguments in the method bodies of the function that I'm replacing, I'm going to stick these vars. Uh, and I'm going to replace any of the applies that like method B, C, D, or E with uh, actually just capturing the function arguments themselves. I'm going to capture these in the vars. And then I'm going to have to go through and figure out where a termination condition is, capture that so I can ultimately trigger the end of the while loop and return it. And uh, let me just say, if you guys ever think like, you know, this problem would be so much easier if I wrote a compiler plugin, no. <laughs> and if you think, I can't think of any other way I'm going to have to do a compiler plugin, think harder. <laughs> because you're going to deal with some of the worst problems ever. And when it finally works, you're going to, oh my gosh, you're going to look like this guy. <laughs> oh, hopefully not so technicolor. So, uh, look, uh, <laughs> oh, you're killing me. <laughs> it's okay. So if you want to recurse like I do, uh, it's really simple. Uh, you can choose the, the version that uh, first came out in a release version with all the caveats of the method size limits. Uh, and I want to say one other thing is, Look, there's also a, a double-edged sword with these method size limits as well, or double whammy, I should say. Not only would you be worried about uh, adding new functionality, uh, could I eventually get a comp compilation error, but if a method size increases too much, there are certain optimizations that runtime your, your JIT optimizer won't do and won't even attempt because it's scared of the size of your method. And it doesn't even have to be 64,000 or close to it. It can be like half of that, and it won't do those optimizations. So. You know, uh, if you're worried about that, definitely use the, the newer thing, which is currently at a snapshot version. It does not do by name parameters. I was struggling really hard to get that done before this uh, conference, uh, but I'll have it done in probably about two weeks' time. Uh, but if you do use the snapshot version, you're going to have some compilation options, uh, plugin options, I should say. The default is, of course, uh, uh, do this transformation in terms of optimizing for method size. So keep the method size as small as possible. Uh, or you can say, you know what, I don't care about my method sizes. The things I'm doing mutually recursively are not going to run into the issues that you've just described. I don't want the additional allocations that that thing has. Give me the old scheme. So you have the choice between the first and the second. And if you do use this stuff, I really do appreciate bug reports. Uh, the ultimate goal that I would like to do with this is first build out a plugin so that if I want mutual tail recursion, I get it. Uh, uh, always. Uh, but then I want to go and sort of approach uh, the Scala guys, the comp compilation guys themselves. And I'm hopefully going to try and convince them that this is a feature that we really do want in the language. Uh, and it's probably going to be some sort of, what is it, uh, is it SIP or S SCP, something like that, some language thing. But then I guess type level will, you know, I'm pretty sure you guys would like it too, so I'll try and get it in there. Uh, so like I said, please, I would really appreciate if people went out, started using this. There are people already using this out in the wild. I know I've gotten questions on that. And anyways, I just want to say thanks. Thanks for letting me come up and, and give a talk about this. So. Uh, if any of you guys have any questions that you want answers to right now, go for it. Thank you. This will be kind of a naive question. What if I have more than one set of mutually recursive functions inside of a class? Any sort of annotation for 
Oh, that's a great question. So if you guys didn't hear it, he's, he wants to know, what if there's a couple groups? So here's the way the compiler wor plugin works. So first of all, yes, you're restricted to a uh, locally type of deal. So either within a def, if you have a bunch of defs, within a single class, within a trait, uh, and, or within like, you know, the module definition or package object. And what it does is it says first, all these methods, their signatures have to be uh, the same. And so it's gonna go through, but then it does something else, getting to your question. It says, okay, where are, where's the call graph? And it actually traces out the call graph and it says, okay, these guys are mutually recursive, I'm gonna take these, and these guys are mutually recursive, I'm gonna take these, and actually will generate, you'll, if you saw it was mutual underscore fn dollar sign zero, but you can have a mutual uh, underscore fn dollar sign one, two, three, so each of your groups will actually be separated out into their own thing. Uh, so you can actually have as many groups of mutually recursive functions as you want. Uh, yeah, you'll just see, you'll see them up when you get, if you ever throw an exception, uh, if you're that kind of developer that likes functions that throw exceptions instead of either's. Uh, next question? Any other questions? Going once? Yeah. concrete example and this is really useful so um, what I would say to you is this is you know if you are writing a tail rec function and you start adding a lot of logic in, you start finding that you have to start making helper functions to pull things out or that you have a bug where there's several different logical branches in that function and what you can do is if you divide it up into a mutual mutually recursive function you can actually attack uh, one of those branches directly uh, almost immediately by introducing what you think will be the bad case and you put in the parameters there at that point within your loop instead of trying to guess what it should finally get down to to trigger it you go right immediately there and it makes uh, writing unit tests uh, some of these kinds of things a lot easier and a lot better uh, there are some things on the internet a lot of times when you see the examples they're not in tail uh, position you know people talking about mutual recursion uh, and trying to come up with a, a solution that can take a general case, uh, any sort of recursion, and map it into this sort of looping construct is really, really hard, especially in the general case, and especially on the JVM. So, yeah. Any other questions? One back there. Wow. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely benchmark. Yeah. So, so actually, uh, let me show you. So, you couldn't really do that. So, so in this case, you know, I, I tried to sort of reuse the tail rack thing, but you know, since I'm recapturing so much stuff, where am I gonna do it? Uh, if I'm going to capture these in a var, you know, the Telrec is probably going to introduce some, some other things underneath. Maybe I could put it in a function that does the Telrec there, but then, you know, how, how to handle that in, in, in a concise way other than while. I mean, the while loop is rather straightforward, and, and if you actually take a look at how the compiler's compiling this, it's actually making just a The tail rec? Could I just reuse that? Um, well, so in the case that you add mutual rec to something that's only recursive with itself, I actually just replace it with tail rec. Um, but as far as like, you know, doing anything sort of confusing in that regards, you know, no, no, I mean, you know, uh, maybe if, if I propose to these guys and they say just use tail rec, great, yes, wonderful, but, uh, for now, I'll, I'll definitely make a distinction. All right, let's give a hand to Owen. All right, thank you.